everybody and a very warm welcome to this symposium. It's going to be an easy one after the last one because all the speakers have little uh, cheats, uh, sheets with their slides actually available. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you also on behalf of my co-chair and esteemed friend Robert Tatala from Bratislava in uh, Slovakia to the AF Symposium by Biotronic, the Satellite Symposium. And during this symposium, we try to cover the whole field of uh, AF from the very early um, diagnosis, be it in symptomatic or asymptomatic patients, um, over um, coincidental um, diagnosis by patients who are carriers of an uh, implantable electronic device, all the way to the final treatment. And this is, of course, a, a wide task. We try to stick in time. And we'll have back-to-back -back talks. and. Um, I hope that you can prepare um, your questions. Uh, we will try to be interactive uh, until the end for the Q&A session. And with that, I would like to hand over to Robert to introduce our first speaker. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, we had a difficult time a couple of minutes ago without electricity, in, at least in whole Copenhagen, as, as, as we were told. So the next topic, uh, next talk is uh, going to be presented by, by uh, Professor Dominic Linz, uh, and he will talk about opportunities to manage uh, the atrial fibrillation screening process. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind of introduction and also uh, for Biotronic to present today on opportunities to manage the atrial fibrillation screening process. So what I actually want to try is first to explain well why do we uh, screen for atrial fibrillation, but then second, importantly, also how. And we also had a practical guide, an ERA guide, which we actually uh, published yesterday also on Europace. And I will also show you a little bit about this, what uh, actually changed compared to the guidelines which we already had before. So I would like to just uh, start with uh, some basics. Well, atrial fibrillation increases st stroke and of course also increases the risk of death. We all know this. The, and this is one reason why it makes sense to identify atrial fibrillation early and also manage atrial fibrillation early. And this is mainly by oral anticoagulation, but also risk factors um, which can lead to complications in those patients. Because by this, we can first reduce the risk of ischemic stroke. We can also reduce the risk of death, potentially. And we can also, at the other hand, we need to be aware, of course, that we do not um, actually overdo it and then um, increase the risk of bleeding. So we really need to understand well which patient first needs to be screened because we just want to screen those patients who also, of course, can benefit from the outcome of those screenings. So this is actually what the current guidelines tell us, and um, they mainly uh, distinguish between opportunistic and systematic um, screening. Opportunistic screening is a screening performed as a part of a clinical context. So a patient actually comes into an outpatient clinic, and there, for example, pulse taking should be performed in patients older than 65. That's the opportunistic screening. The systematic screening is actually that really systematically, continuously, um, irrespective of medical contacts, uh, pulse taking is actually done or also an ECG is written. And this is recommended in those patients older than 75 years or those at high risk of stroke. And there's a 2AB indication for those patients for systematic screening and opportunistic screening. Well, this is a 1B recommendation. This is the ESC guideline. And just uh, yesterday, we also published now the ERA uh, practical guide, how to use health devices and also how to integrate this into screening opportunities and this is if you just compare this directly so um, it doesn't actually change the guidelines it just actually extends a little bit the guidelines the first thing is systematic screening by intermittent ECG is beneficial to detect AF in individual aged older than uh, 75 so that's actually a should indication. And then the main indication, well, that's the yellow one, is systematic screening intermittent by ECG in those older than 65 with comorbidities. I will come back to this. And also opportunistic screening for AF in those um, older than 65 without comorbidities or even older, younger than those 65 with comorbidities. <laughs> 
the question is, of course, which kind of devices do we have available? And um, we can see here in this uh, slide that there are a lot of different devices available. Different technologies are used by those different wearable devices. Some of them use mainly ECG, which is able to diagnose also atrial fibrillation. Some others use photoplethysmography. So this is really like uh, just a pulse taking. You can distinguish between fast and slow and irregular or regular. But um, those devices have very good algorithms nowadays integrated to really detect atrial fibrillation, not diagnose. And we also focus on this in our practical guide, really comparing PPG on the left-hand side, ECG on the right-hand side. The main thing is, PPG is widely available in, for example, smart watches. Every mobile phone can more or less uh, record a um, yeah, waveform. But the thing is, this is not sufficient to diagnose AF, because to diagnose, this is also clearly mentioned in the guidelines, you still need an ECG also in the future. Photoplastrosmography is new. It's not just new for our patients, it's also new for us cardiologists. And what we uh, tried to put together is a PPG dictionary. So we really tried to introduce, well, how to look at a PPG signal and then step by step also identify whether, for example, a specific arrhythmia is present or not. And this is now also published in European Heart Journal Digital Health. So if you're interested in this, just check this out. In addition to those variable devices, there are also implantables. And this is, for example, those implantable loop recorders. There are different um, yeah, kinds of those implantable loop recorders available um, from different companies. Um, there, there might be some advantages of some of them over others. So, for example, this long uh, sensing antenna just has a, di a larger di distance between those two electrodes, which might be um, more effective in detecting P waves. And those P waves, of course, can be very, very interesting and also good to distinguish between an irregular sinus rhythm for example, also with respiratory arrhythmia, which is just challenging if you just look at uh, rates, for example, compared uh, to atrial fibrillation itself. This is also, again, from the ERA uh, practical guide, and I will uh, just try to guide you a little bit through this. So what device to use at what time point and in which way and in which patient. So if you have, for example, a patient who already had a stroke, you actually hear you're actually here at this side. So you, then systematic screening is recommended and uh, should also be performed. If you did not have a prior stroke and if your patient is older than 75, then again, you end up actually with this uh, systematic screening approach. And you also end up with this systematic screening approach if your patient is um, older than uh, 65 and at least has one comorbidity of those mentioned here in the middle. So those are actually patients who um, might actually profit from this uh, systematic screening. The opportunistic screening is actually with those lower risk patients. So 65, no comorbidities, opportunistic, and those younger than 65, they also end up actually in the opportunistic or actually no screening. Recommendation. And this is also important, so not just to know who should be screened, but on the other hand also who should probably not be screened, because otherwise we have a very big number of patients where we also need to uh, see then well how to manage the result, which might be yeah, not wrong, uh, not, not right actually in all cases. Another thing what I would also like to stress here is the difference between PPG, photoplasmography, and ECG. And the thing is which device to use. Well, I think if you have a lower risk patient where it is very unlikely that this patient actually has atrial fibrillation, but if you nevertheless want to exclude atrial fibrillation, for the exclusion of atrial fibrillation, even for a longer period of time, photoplasmography can be very effective because it's not about diagnosing, it's actually about uh, exclusion. And then actually those PPGs might be very effective. ECG is particularly in those patients um, uh, effective and also uh, useful if you already have a high uh, pretest probability. So if you have a high risk patient where you expect that atrial fibrillation might be present, then probably just use a ECG based wearable device because then you can also diagnose atrial fibrillation based on the results directly. Um, it's also a little bit the question, well, how long should we screen and what uh, type of device should we actually use in those different uh, settings? And 
what we rec recommended in here in the ERA uh, practical guide is mainly you should also ask your patient, well, how often do you actually have symptoms? And this is important because if you, for example, have a patient who has continuously symptoms, then just write an ECG and actually see whether this patient has persistent AF. But if you have then a patient who has daily, weekly, monthly, yearly symptoms, then you can more or less decide which kind of approach would be actually the best way to go here. And uh, the interesting thing is that we, of course, also now have those patches. We have Holter ECGs, which can be performed at least for a couple of weeks. And we also have the single lead ECG variable devices which can be particularly then be performed when a patient has symptoms. And those actually um, are really now useful to, yeah, to, to, to um, monitor and also to diagnose atrial fibrillation in some of those patients. If you have still a patient who has just once a year or so symptoms, I think then really a long-term monitoring, if it is very important to exclude or diagnose AF, is uh, really, of course, a good way to go. We have uh, different uh, studies now at the moment uh, really looking at, well, what, what is actually the use of screening. I will not go into t detail here too much, but actually just showing you that there were the stroke stop and also the loop study. Both of them were very, very big, large. Both of them actually included higher risk patients, older patients. And the main message here is that even if you actually manage to screen and also, um, uh, yeah, uh, activate and, and initiate anticoagulation, then afterwards you either do not have an effect or just a very small effect, at least on, on those um, uh, outcomes which were tested in this uh, study, and we can actually discuss probably afterwards why this is. The main point is also where we need to understand how to integrate also all those findings which we finally have. And to integrate really mHealth's information and also information from implantables, well, there we need to think about pathways, about patient dashboards, about patient apps, also re-feedbacking uh, all the information, not just to us physicians, but also to the patients. And there are now more and more of those kind of uh, devices coming on the market, which we need to understand how to use them effectively. So I would like to summarize, there are several opportunities to screening for AF, and there are the guidelines, but now also the ERA practical guide, which really like guides us through this jungle of different variable devices, of different um, implantables. There are the variables, there are the implantable loop recorders, CIEIDs, of, co of course, which are actually can also provide some information. We need to understand how to integrate this all in platforms. And finally, I think we need to be aware that the key, the center, particularly if we go to the use of variables, is actually our patient. Because the patient education and the understanding of the patient, why a patient uses an Apple Watch, why the patient uses a specific app, is very important because this determines also how the adherence is. So patient education uh, seems to be very, very key. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Dominic. Uh, brilliant talk, a uh, topic which we cannot avoid. Patients will show up with all these recordings in the future and we'll discuss it later. It's my great pleasure now to introduce the second speaker, Thomas Dennecke from Bad Neustadt in Germany. And uh, his talk is entitled, When is the best time to act upon AF in which patients? And here we particularly refer to atrial high rate episodes, also known as subclinical AF. Thomas. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be uh, back in rhythm or back to rhythm here in Copenhagen and see you all in person. Thanks to Biotronic for making this possible. Um, I will discuss a little dilemma that Dominic already um, introduced um, because um, subclinical atrial fibrillation just indicates some episodes of high atrial uh, rate which is detected by usually atrial implanted leads, uh, but we do not have an EKG, a 12 lead EKG of an atrial fibrillation episode, so we cannot call this clinical atrial fibrillation. Um, even though we would wish we could, uh, we could have a clear recommendation on what to do with these patients, we just don't. So we will discuss that later on, that we're just missing that scientific link to what to do in patients with atrial high rate episodes. Um, when talking about those ICD patients who have atrial high rate episodes, um, 
we have to make uh, we have to be aware that this is really two things atrial fibrillation on the one hand and uh, reduced left ventricular ejection fraction on the other hand that are often combined and often beget each other. So they have the same comorbidities, they have the same electrical and mechanical remodeling processes, which means that the one just begets the other and we can diagnose atrial fibrillation in at least 30% of those patients who have a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And even more, the more severe the redu reduced left ventricular dysfunction is. Um, in ICD patients, we can see um, unrecognized AF uh, in up to 60% of the cases, and most of these episodes, especially if they are very short, are asymptomatic, so um, it makes sense to discuss this with the patient um, and just monitor implanted devices for these episodes. If we diagnose atrial fibrillation in patients with uh, heart failure, this implies the urgent need for therapy in this cohort. That means we need to potentially optimize uh, heart failure therapy. We need to uh, implement oral anticoagulation. And third, rate or rhythm control, um, either way, um, if needed, um, needs to be initiated. In heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction, this is slightly different in patients with preserved uh, or mildly reduced ejection fraction, um, is a atrial fibrillation is a marker of mortality, and actually it's a risk factor for mortality. The difference is that a risk factor is modifiable, and we've known from current catheter ablation trials that actually we can change the um, we can change the outcome of these patients by effective uh, rhythm control. So these studies all indicate that actually AF in patients with heart failure increases mortality by a factor uh, approximately 50 percent higher. Um, so let's just start with a case. What would you do in this case? This is a patient. 69-year-old, uh, three-vessel coronary artery disease, ejection fraction 26%, um, had a CRTD implanted for primary prophylaxis in uh, five years ago, and uh, has a CHATS VAS score of five, and now we see these um, multiple episodes of high atrial rhythm, which is uh, recognized by the device, which is uh, indicated on uh, the follow-up monitoring, and these durations are in between three and a half minutes up to six hours. So no EKG. The, the guidelines would recommend not to, uh, to scrutinize for clinical um, uh, AF, which means perform regular EKG monitoring um, and just uh, monitor the uh, burden of these arrhythmias, but would not indicate um, oral anticoagulation, and the reason, I guess, is just that we do not have the scientific basis for putting these patients on uh, anticoagulation, and we may discuss that later on. But, of course, patients with these high-rate episodes have an association to clinical AF. There are multiple studies, and all these studies um, are, uh, are um, related to one thing that is crucial to understand. Each vendor of these devices actually have a different definition of atrial high rate episodes and of the burden, which makes it really, really hard to conclude that. Um, but subclinical atrial fibrillation or atrial high rate episodes is associated with a six-fold increased risk for clinical AF, and the longer these episodes are, the more likely or the stronger is the predictive value of uh, documenting true atrial fibrillation. So there's a clear relation between those two. And also atrial high rate episodes, even if indicated to be subclinical AF, ha are associated with an increased risk of stroke. Um, there are multiple studies and they are all listed here, um, as you can see. Again, the vendor-specific uh, vendor definition of atrial high rate episodes, but in total, subclinical uh, AF is associated with a 
5.4 times increased risk of stroke. And you can see that it's, of course, depending on the individual uh, risk factor score, as you can see here, but also if, uh, if you include all patients, subclinical AF implies a higher risk for stroke compared to patients who do not have um, atrial high rate episodes. The one thing that is pretty sure is that very short episodes of atrial high rate episode, uh, atrial high, rate, uh, high, high rhythm, um, less than six minutes, appears to be associated with a very low stroke risk. Um, but the question, for example, is if multiple six minute uh, episodes uh, would include into a higher risk is completely unclear. So for now, um, it is unclear if these patients really benefit from all anticoagulation and specifically the threshold when to anticoagulate this patient will be a, a critical discussion in the future. Um, and th there are some hints I just want to uh, briefly allude, uh, uh, indicate to you that the burden of these atrial high rate episodes is more critical than actually the existence of these episodes. So it's not a binary condition. Again, atrial fibrillation also is not a binary condition. It's either there or not. It's more the burden of atrial fibrillation or the burden of these uh, atrial high rate episodes that is important for the risks associated with this. I will only focus on the um, on the stroke risk because this is, uh, this is easiest and um, uh, at least to some degree well studied. So um, in this study, uh, which has pooled data from prospective uh, device trials, actually indicates that one hour per day of atrial high rate episodes is, is associated with a high risk of stroke. As you can see here, the, the risk increases from having up to one hour to one hour or, or higher daily atrial fibrillation burden or atrial high rate episode burden. Um, on the other hand, the assert trial, again, depending on the individual uh, vendor specific definition of atrial high rate episodes, indicates that the duration of the longest atrial high rate episode is important and if it's 24 hours or higher, the, the risk of stroke is comparable to having clinical atrial fibrillation. So um, I think putting this all together, the arrhythmia burden is critical and this can only be identified if we have continuous monitoring of the arrhythmia burden. So. Um, it's not a binary risk factor, but it's most likely related to the quantitative uh, situation of these atrial high rate episodes and of atrial fibrillation. And there is a wide range of different scenarios how you can define the atrial uh, fibrillation burden or the atrial high rate episode burden. And you can see there are multiple definitions out there which makes it so hard to clearly look through the scientific data that we have today and draw robust conclusions. One thing we can do though is if we look into the, the scenario of patients who have clinical documented atrial fibrillation, and this is a, a wonderful study from Rachel Kaplan uh, published in 2017, indicating that the stroke risk really depends upon two things, about the individual risk profile of the patient, which is the chats vas score on the one hand, and on the atrial fibrillation burden on the other hand. The higher your atrial fibrillation burden is, um, the lower your chats vas score can be and you can still benefit from all anticoagulation. So um, if you have a chance vas score of two and you have an AF uh, burden of 24 hours, you should get anticoagulation. If you have an, a chance vas score of three, but only uh, of two, but only have shorter episodes of atrial fibrillation, you may not benefit from all anticoagulation. So it's really a relation of AF burden on the one hand and your risk profile on the other hand. And this was also implemented in the current um, ESC AF guidelines, which I think the authors did a great job 
in putting all this together and all the uncertainties about these atrial high rate episodes. So there are some things that you need to consider. Longer episodes are associated with increased risk of clinical atrial fibrillation and stroke. So an episode longer than six minutes would be associated with major adverse events. On the other hand, um, these atrial high rate episode burden is not static. It may change day by day. And this implies that we really need to continuously monitor our patients for the change in burden of atrial high rate episodes. And as you can see, just coming back to our patient um, that I presented, having a chance of score of five or higher would pose a high risk, especially if you have long episodes of atrial high rate um, rhythm. And this would lead you to considering all anticoagulation also in this cohort, even though we do not have any um, any data on that so far. And um, Thomas, we are I running behind a little. That's or? all we all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I mean, it's a, it's a great, it's a really broad and wide topic, and we want to have time to discuss it. That's why no, um, I hope you don't take it too possible. serious that I interrupted you. Okay. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Isabel Deisenhofer for the last um, topic, which is now actually on state-of-the-art opportunities to treat atrial fibrillation. So we are in a different field now. And Isabel, also to your applies, unfortunately, we are a little behind already. It'd be great if you could stay in time. Um, I try to. <laughs> I give my very best. Yeah, so um, I think uh, what you heard about uh, the management of AFIP already is always true and we always have these two choices, rate or rhythm control and uh, very depressingly our options, what to do then in rate and rhythm control are a little bit similar because we have medication and we can uh, ablate, but of course we ablate with very different um, uh, targets uh, when we want to do uh, rhythm control because we would then perform a PV isolation to really eliminate atrial fibrillation. And currently this decision is mostly based on symptoms. So what about these asymptomatic subclinical atrial fibrillation and the assumed success or the assumed complication rate in the patient that we uh, want to have for ablation and I think we have really now enough data and uh, we should broaden uh, this um, decision uh, taking um, reasons a little bit because we have good data showing is that we have long-term outcomes that are associated with ongoing atrial fibrillation as has been for pointed out our heart failure increased risk for heart failure increased risks for dementia and even for mortality so um, to do rate control, I think uh, uh, in modern times, maybe you have to justify a little bit yourself why you go first for rate control and not for rhythm control. So if you want to do um, rhythm control, of course there's PVI. And I was always fascinated by the question, why is it the PVs? Why are singular ectopics from the PVs inducing atrial fibrillation? And why is that not the case with other singular ectopics coming from elsewhere? And um, if you look at the data that we have, we know that uh, there is a special point to these um, osteal areas around the PVs, that antral region, and um, I'm trying to activate, yeah. Uh, this laser. So this region here, which I depicted with these small arrows, um, uh, there has been a multitude of data showing that these antral regions, in fact, is a slow conducting area. And uh, atopics coming from inside the pulmonary veins um, to this uh, antral area uh, really hit this functional slow conduction and then might create micro entries. So that um, our ablation, so the encircling of the PVs, is probably most effective if we really can eliminate also all this antral region and not just isolate the vein deep inside the vein, uh, which is not healthy anyway. 
Um, but what I want to challenge today a little bit is the notion that probably these PV firings that we see during our ablation sometimes are maybe micro reentries that really occur at this antral region. And I brought with you a very old tracing. Well, it's from 2013. We did a study at that time where we tried to pace um, with the next stimulus from the pulmonary veins to look which pulmonary vein might be especially arrhythmogenic and to uh, isolate this preferentially. And what we looked for with these extra stimulus was the degree of decrementality at the respective antral region. And you see here a tracing from the left inferior pulmonary vein. Here up is the right inferior. And we paced within that left inferior pulmonary vein. And you can appreciate in the next, um, in, with these arrows, that we had a basic train cycle. And then we have this extra stimulus introduced here. And then a lot of things is happening which I think is extremely interesting. The one is that we have this very, very delayed response of the atrium. You see that the, we pace inside the uh, PV, and while normally in the, uh, in the base cycle, the atrial uh, co uh, uh, conduction to the atrium is very fast. Here with the extra stimulus, it lasts a long, long, long time. And look at this uh, tracing here. You have this small response, and then you have sort of a micro reentry that is activating that vein. It looks like a firing from the vein, but as I said, I would challenge that. I think that it's the micro reentry that we activated by um, inducing this decrementality of the conduction from inside the vein to the antral region. And then the antral region serves like a, an augmenter of this one extra stimulus to a sort of a train of firing. And it induced, uh, in fact, um, uh, atrial fibrillation, this one extra stimulus. So what do we know? Well, we do know that we can, with pulmonary vein isolation, then reach quite high success rates. And that's just one example um, from our center where we uh, tested for a high power short duration technique of ablation with a point-by-point -point PV encircling. And we found it's very fast, it's effective, and you can see uh, in the results that uh, even if we do it with standard power, we have quite high success rates in um, these um, patients uh, when we do a pulmonary vein isolation, uh, and that is maintained at least over a year, and there are a plentitude of studies showing that it's even maintained longer. But these were patients that were treated before with some drugs. So what about first line? And the complication rate was really low. So we feel good about um, PV isolation. But what about first line ablation? And we have uh, two trials uh, that were published recently. We have some trials in the past that showed us, yes, also in first line therapy, we have very good results with the PV uh, isolation, and we can cure a lot of patients from atrial fibrillation. And this was put together in a recent uh, meta-analysis, um, uh, taking together the data from cryo and RF versus antiarrhythmic drugs. So you see this sort of triangle of treatment that we have. And um, what uh, this meta-analysis could show is that uh, pulmonary vein isolation is significantly better than antiarrhythmic drug treatment uh, uh, to cure somebody from atrial fibrillation or to eliminate atrial fibrillation at least in these patients for a certain time. As I said, for the very, very long outcome, we maybe don't know, but for the reasonable long outcome of one to five years, we have very, very good numbers and are very confident that we can help these patients. So what is, um, and the, we will have a new player in the field because we will have post-field ablation, so this might even uh, change this uh, to the positive side again. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is persistent atrial fibrillation, and this is a table uh, in, fr taken from the STAR-IF2 trial where more than 400 patients were randomized to different ablation techniques and strategies. So PVI alone, PVI plus cafe ablation, and PVI plus lines. And um, I just highlighted the traditional endpoint that we normally have when we look at ablation trials and the results of ablation trials um, in atrial fibrillation patients. So freedom from any atrial tachycardia, not only atrial fibrillation, but any uh, atrial tachyarrhythmia after one procedure without antiarrhythmic drugs. And even in the best group, which happened to be the PBI group in this study, you see that we cannot reach more than 40%. Um, that's not totally devastating, but it's not where we want to be, I think. 
So um, I think we have a problem there. And um, the problem is what we would call the substrate. So what is it what maintains atrial fibrillation and, um, and uh, by this uh, uh, keeps the patient in atrial fibrillation and prevents that our ablation is successful. And there have been a lot of approaches to what is substrate. And I think if you ask uh, three electrophysiologists, you get probably four answers. So it's, it's really difficult. And I just uh, uh, wrote you the, the, the hit list of, uh, well, of all the proposed mechanisms and functional changes, fibrosis, rotors, instable microentries, focal discharges or the autonomic uh, system. So we have a lot of things that uh, could be addressed then and how to address these uh, different substrate types best. And uh, as a consequence, we has, have also a lot of uh, strategies to map and ablate this substrate. So there's an anatomical approach, which is a little bit like one size fits all. We do always the same. And uh, as for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, where we do always PVI, we hope that we have a uh, reproducible um, uh, result of this. Uh, we have mapping guided approaches, which are highly individualized therapies, because then you map individually the substrate and try to find out, okay, what will help best in this individual patient. And uh, the next uh, is then extra cardio tissue pressure. And I just want to focus a little bit on these individualized uh, therapies, because that's the one I, I like most, and um, show you one of these, that's the charge density mapping guided um, uh, possibility with the AccuMap. You, I think, all know the catheter, which uh, serves here as uh, the basis of the mapping. It's an ultrasound, um, uh, uh, a catheter with ultrasound probes on it, which can reconstruct the cardiac anatomy from within one position uh, in the atrium. And then uh, the um, electrograms pick up um, uh, remote uh, electrograms and do what uh, we call then a charge density map of this, um, of this atrium. And what uh, we can find then is three different um, local conduction patterns that occur during atrial fibrillation. The one is more focal that you see here on the left hand. The one is more rotational, so, but looks a little bit like what, what rotors looked when we looked at that in Topera. And then what I find, I think is most fascinating is localized irregular activation where you really see that this is like ongoing chaos and we have, uh, we just get a hint uh, how this works. So if you do these maps and follow these maps uh, and ablate uh, consequently uh, following these maps, you get these kind of lesion sets, which are complex and, as I said, which are individualized. It's a basal lesion. You always have the PV uh, isolation, of course, but then you have different kind of ablations. And when you do this in a study, which was done in the Uncover AF trial, which was a prospective registry with 13 centers and a little bit almost 130 patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. You can look at the results, and I think they did a, a bright job because they tried to differentiate between the different endpoints. So um, six-month arrhythmia-free or six-month AF-free and then six and, and so on, and uh, always then with a the differentiation with AADs added or not. And um, if you look at the success rate, we are, for, I mean, and, and that's something that we have to look on and consecutively, I think, follow down the road. We are much better than the star AF numbers. Still, we are not probably satisfied, but we are 15, 16% higher than what we saw in the star AF results. So in conclusion, I think we have um, uh, now with the new studies that came out, we have new findings that should lead us to uh, really consider rhythm control as first-line therapy for AFib patients because we know that the long-term outcome of ongoing AFib are not good. In paroxysmal AFib, we, I think we have a very robust and very um, reliable uh, treatment with the uh, pulmonary vein isolation. And uh, we also have very reliable data that pulmonary vein isolation is superior to medication even in a first-line setting. And in persistent AFib, in the moment, well, we have no, none of these PVI plus approaches, which, is, which shows consistently and reproducibly better data than PVI alone, but we have some hints. And 
I'm still absolutely um, convinced that in persistent AF, we have so many faces of this substrate um, and so many facets that we have to adjust our ablation strategy to this individual formation of uh, the, uh, the individual substrate in that uh, given patient and personalize our approach to the specific patient. And for this, it's then very, very good to have a large toolbox of different ablation techniques, and you just pick up the, the one that fits to your patient, but you should be able to have lines in your toolbox. You should have uh, uh, electrogram guided ablation in your toolbox, and you should have also maybe some kind of, of uh, uh, extra cardiac ablation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Um, Isabel, great talk. Unfortunately, we only have time for one question to each of the speakers, and I would like to start and um, ask Dominic that this whole issue of screening as a double-edged sword, um, there's a reason why there are only very few uh, malignancies, for instance, where we really have systematic screening programs in most uh, countries. So we have a 1B um, indication for opportunistic screening in elderly patients in Europe. The Americans, on the other hand, who um, published their recommendations a couple of years later, they don't have that. So how do you, how do you explain this uh, discrepancy? Yeah, so I think actually this is still a um, yeah, recommendation which is really developing because we actually need more data and we also see just those uh, studies which I just presented very, very briefly that the data is not as clear as we think. So the, the, the main point is probably also that the tools are now coming to detect AF, but what we also need to understand is how to treat early AF of those patients who are suddenly popping up, and, and we need to actually treat them early. And then this is anticoagulation, this is rhythm control, what, what you actually mentioned, and then also comorbidity. So, so I think we, we need to actually now to really make a difference not just the right apps, not just the right devices, not just the right recommendations, but also the right approach to finally make the difference by the management, the early management of the patients. Thomas also showed this, this lovely picture that relates the AF duration to the CHATS score, And um, I think this is really important. This is something I would actually expect of future guidelines to incorporate that. Okay, Robert. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I would maybe add to, the, to your remark that uh, we are nowadays uh, lured by new technologies which allow uh, to monitor ECG in a continuous and long term. And the question, of course, the most important question we were asking more or less in all three uh, presentations, does it make sense to use these new technologies? And, uh, in order to make sense, it, uh, some criteria must be fulfilled. The, the number one, uh, you need the tools to detect it reliably. We have it, more or less. Then you need uh, that the problem you want to screen for is, is a public health issue. Uh, this, this we know is a public health issue because the, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is increasing. And number three is that, okay, if we find the individuals who have the condition, can we treat them reliably to, and uh, eliminate their risk? And, and this is the, the most important point. And I think until now we were very much focused on, on stroke. Okay, we detect atrial fibrillation, anticoagulate, we have new fantastic anticoagulants, we will get rid of strokes. Certainly not, because not all are, are, are cardioembolic, and the loop trial, uh, we have discussed it in the previous uh, session, has very nicely shown, shown that. But even if you screen with the latest technology a very high-risk population, what we presumed is a very high-risk population, the outcome was marginal. We, the outcome measured not in how much atrial fibrillation we detect, but can, if we treat this fibrillation, can we reduce the strokes? And the results were marginal. So we have to be, we have to be uh, careful in, in this issue. But there is now a new point, uh, a new aspect, which, which adds to this, uh, I would say, conventional uh, aspect. And this is, we have new data which show that if we treat atrial fibrillation early, and this is, these are the results from the East AFNET uh, trial, that if, if, we, if we act early, we can 
uh, do a lot of benefit to the patient. And, and, and so, so my, my question um, uh, would be, for instance, uh, maybe for Thomas, uh, do you believe that, let's say, a typical, uh, if we detect uh, high, atrial high rate episodes in a patient with uh, Usually, these patients who have some kind of pacemakers very often has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But when atrial fibrillation goes on top of that, this is probably a major factor which will transform the half PEF into half REF very frequently. Uh, do, can you imagine an approach, okay, we find increasing burden of atrial fibrillation in patients with half PEF? And if we ablate it, we could possibly prevent further re or future reducing ejection fraction. <clears throat> That's a tough question and a lot of speculation from my side. But I think that most of these patients with have PEF who get atrial fibrillation actually are pretty symptomatic too. Because this is comparable to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients who just feel they, if they lose their atrial contractile function, they really suffer from that. So I would think that we can, by treating this early, and the question is how do we treat it early? Uh, most probably it's then catheter ablation. Um, I think we can do the patient good. I'm not sure how much, and, and that comes back to my presentation, I'm not sure how much atrial fibrillation burden is really bad compared to uh, and how we define that. And, and so there are so many, many open questions. I think we just need to make sure that we really monitor these patients for atrial high rate episodes. Um, and if we do that continuously, we will learn a lot about the timely dimension of atrial fibrillation in relation to poor outcome. Thank you very much. Isabel, um you very nicely illustrated that we are pretty much um, on top of the problem of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and that we have beautiful tools but also a plethora of ideas of how to treat uh, persistent atrial fibrillation and uh, which uh, techniques to use. So now, um, having heard and also having the data from AFNet, shouldn't we put more emphasis on monitoring AF progression? Because so far we are just looking at the initial detection of atrial fibrillation, but if a patient is asymptomatic or not very symptomatic, we, we may anticoagulate him, but should we then follow him more closely um, as to whether he develops persistent atrial fibrillation? Because if we could ablate them early on, upstream ablation, we may not uh, really face the big problem of this flood of persistent AF. Yeah, may, yeah of course, we should. And, and, and that might sound a little bit um, provocative, but, but we, we do it in our center because I'm always asking myself, so what am I waiting for? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, this, this, this watch and wait strategy in AFib, we have really demonstrated over the last 22 years that it's, it's leading nowhere. It, it's just... The, the inevitable will happen. The, these, these persons will end up in persistent atrial fibrillation, and then we lose a lot of, of uh, the options that we have by doing a PVE isolation. And, and for me, it's even just the other way around. Um, if we knew that all atrial high rate episodes, even the non clinical or asymptomatic ones, will end up in atrial fibrillation, if we know that, what are we waiting for? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I would always try to, really to, to upfront the ablation as, as, fast, as far as possible and to, really to, to discuss with the patient very intensively this. So we have a, a clinical course before you and we know already where this will end and how long should we wait? Mm -hmm. And for an ablationist, it's always the same. Don't wait any, uh, any more seconds because the atrium will have some remodeling and it's always in the wrong direction. And we leave the atrium to the atrial fibrillation remodeling a longer time for, for what? For, for nothing. So if we had um, really robust numbers from atrial high rate episode patients, uh, how many of these really only stay in high rate episodes for a long time and don't develop AFib, uh, 
versus the percentage of patients who will, over the course of the next five to 10 years, will develop atrial fibrillation. If we had that very robustly, I think that this, this early decision on to an early ablation would be done much more often. And it would be, in my view, it would be beneficial. Yeah, uh, maybe these technologies could be useful also in another aspect, and I will again focus on, on heart failure. I think, in general, we, we underestimate the, the malignant potential of atrial fibrillation yeah. as, a, as a trigger for heart failure. Yes. Uh, we, we, uh, to accept, accept, if the physician accepts atrial fibrillation, newly detected atrial fibrillation, so we know now for certain that it's not good for the patient. Is uh, uh, good for the maybe for the comfort of the of the physician, but is definitely not good for the patient. And what we what we know that a very simple old rhythm control strategy, like cardioversion, 80% of patients in the large registries never receive a cardioversion. And I, I think uh, this could be an additional pool of uh, a population which would be very interesting for for screening. You, I have newly detected atrial fibrillation persistent, you cardiovert, and then you can screen for recurrences and possibly treat with one of the nice ablation techniques and prevent heart failure at least at a certain proportion of this population. At the moment, we do not know which population is it quite exactly. MRI imaging could help, may, maybe, but so I think this is, this is also a uh, neglected aspect of, of, of screening uh, for atrial fibrillation as a trigger for heart failure. Yeah, and, and I think what is, in my view, you have to throw yourself in the way of this atrial fibrillation in these heart failure patients. You have to prevent by all means yeah. that this is sort of an ongoing AFib uh, history. But um, you can also have then a combination. If you don't want to ablate right now, you can at least give some antirhythmics. You, uh, you should really try to avoid that this uh, is a developing AFib history. And, and as you pointed out, uh, we have very clear results from multiple um, trials now showing us that especially in heart failure, you should really, really consider AFib as a malignant um, uh, additional condition which um, deteriorates the, the clinical course immensely. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Just very, very short take-home message for me. We have all the tools for screening atrial fibrillation, now a plethora of tools. We need to learn how to implement them, and we certainly need to shy away from the perception that atrial fibrillation is either a risk marker or a risk factor. It is both. And we need to have a comprehensive evaluation of the risk of the patient. The whole problem of atrial high rate episodes that um, Thomas was reporting about um, in terms of anticoagulation will be addressed and solved hopefully within the next two years with NOAA AF and Artesia trials. And um, the final remark also, um, Isabel made that very clear, the earlier we ablate atrial fibrillation, the better we are certainly in terms of our ablation success, but probably also in the outcome for the patient. And with that, I would like to thank Biotronic to make the symposium possible, you for your attendance and the speakers for the great talks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.